Hi guys, we're going to be talking, I'm going to be explaining to you this paper. I know this is a more challenging paper, different to the ones that we have worked with before. That's why I'm recording this video. Now, this paper, uh, it's an old paper, 2001. It was written by Shankar. It's called, as you can see here, Cultural Distance Revisited Towards a More Rigorous Conceptualization and Measurement of Cultural Differences. Now, it is more specific and it's more related with international business, which I love and I think is very useful to you guys, to your program. But to understand this paper, which I have here, and I'm going to be showing you a little bit, um, you're going to see that we have to discuss more things. But what does he want to do? Mr. Shankar here is trying to make a framework to understand the construct of cultural distance and to enhance the rigor of that construct. So, how does he plan to do that? Well, first of all, he makes some interesting things clear. First of all, in management, the cultural, the, uh, cultural distance construct has been used in, as a key variable in a strategy, management, organization behavior, and human resource management. So, the cultural distance construct is important. Um, and we want to work with it. We want to understand it better. And, um, you know, um, why were people using it? Because it was, a, you know, a convenient tool and um, it would be a quantitative measure that you could employ with other hard data. And here he starts quoting quote, Kogut and Singh. Now, you're going to see, if you read this paper, you're going to see this quote a lot. They quote Kogut and Singh a lot. Um, why? Um, well, basically because they criticize them. Because they say, well, there's a serious problem in conceptualization and measurement. They're basically saying the way we have used culture so far in international business and in management in general has not been very, uh, you know, convincing. And, and there are a lot of issues. And they start outlining, out, uh, outlining those issues. But before outlining those issues, uh, they're going to say, well, in, uh, it's, it's being used mostly in foreign direct investment literature in three ways, with three primary trusts, you know, three, three special cases in which they use it. Which are those cases? Well, the first one, which is delineated here, very well specified, is cultural distance and the launch or the sequence of foreign investment. So they think, uh, or they, the way the, the construct has been used, is to account for the very decision of firms to invest in a foreign country. And basically the idea is that firms are less likely to invest in culturally distant markets. And uh, they give a couple of examples and uh, they say, well, this is being used to predict the, sequ the sequence of multiple foreign entries. So basically, uh, the idea here is that um, you start your internationalization with countries that are culturally close to you. And then you move gradually to culturally distant countries. That is what we have, you know, uh, come to know as the Uppsala process model basically which accounts which takes into account the psychic distance or you know other people call this theory the Scandinavian school by this moment you should be familiar with this now this is based on the idea that culture does matter and that cultural differences can account for the decisions that managers make regarding which markets they're going to enter first and later but the support for the thesis has been very limited. So much that if you have been, you know, reading the papers that you should have been reading uh, for, for your international management classes, you see that the Uppsala School has changed significantly since that initial um, definition. <clears throat> Another way in which this has been used... Um, is to, uh, wait, where's the title? To explain cultural distance and entry mode. The first one was regarding the sequence. Which countries do I go first 
when I do foreign direct investment. This one has to do with the country mode, with the with the entry mode. So what do I use? Do I use a wholly owned subsidiary or an international joint venture? Or I go with a license? Or do I export? And apparently those decisions could be explained also from culture. Because basically the idea here is that the degree of control declines as the environment becomes less favorable. Therefore, with more cultural distance, you are going to favor um, entry modes that are going to give you less control. Higher distance with higher cost transactions due to information cost and difficulty tr of transferring competencies as it scales. So they basically say that culture post presents a problem of transferability. The more culturally distant the country is, the more difficult it is to transfer advantages to another market, the more difficult it is to negotiate, to acquire information, and to, um, you know, basically trans do any transaction. Um, and as with the others, <clears throat> um, the assumption here is that international operations are highly uncertain, which they are, and since they are uncertain, as much as you have higher cultural distance, that uncertainty is going to make it more costly for the company to operate. But cultural distance does not fit very well within the transaction cost argument, and the theory can accommodate opposite prediction of cultural distance to control mode. I could easily argue that because there's high cultural distance, I'm going to export because I don't want to deal with those issues or that I could, that, or that I am going to control the operations totally with a wholly owned subsidiary and I'm going to internalize uh, in order to avoid transaction costs. So it's, 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 uh, that's not very solid conceptually, right? And um, we don't have um, you know, a form of explaining consistently um, all of those results that are inconsistent. And cultural distance has also been used to explain affiliate performance. To account to, we all know that different affiliates in different parts of the world are going to be having differences in their return on sales or their return on investment or the you know, return on invested capital or, you know, market share, whatever. They have differences in performance. Now, why? One of the reasons is maybe because cultural distance explains, because it's more difficult to operate in countries that are culturally different. But the empirical results don't, don't really support this idea. And then uh, they go and explain the hidden assumptions. Now, to explain the hidden assumptions, I have to go back here and I have to explain to you another paper. Remember that I was telling you about Kogut and Singh? Well, basically what they did is was a study to try to correlate uh, national culture, a measure of cultural distance that they develop, and entry mode. And how do they do that? I'm going to go here and I'm going to show you this beautiful paper. This is a classic. This is one of the most quoted papers from the Journal of International Business Studies. And it's going to be useful to you, you know, to become acquainted with this, with this paper. This is not a mandatory paper for the class, uh, but I do recommend that you read it and you become familiar with that. What was this paper trying to do? Analyze data on 228 entries into the United States marked by acquisition, wholly on Greenfield, and joint venture. Why a study for indirect investment in the United States? Because the United States captures most of the um, of the foreign direct investment in the world is amazing. So it's a great case study for you know how the companies decide to enter into this market and if they are affected by cultural distance. Um, and they try to do that you know statistically and um, accounting or controlling for feminine industry level variables. And they look at acquisitions, joint ventures, and greenfield investment. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna spend time in that because I think that you can understand the differences there. Um, 
But suffice it to say that they also are based partially on the idea of the uh, Uppsala model of progressive internationalization. And um, that they say that differences in cultures influence the perceptions of managers. And the perceptions of managers determine, in turn, decision-making. Remember, decision-making is very su subjective. And if decision-making is very subjective, then culture should have a role to play there. That's basically what they're saying. And, and why does it have a role? Well, because of the perceived real cost of uncertainty in mode of entry. Therefore, uh, they should be preferring one or another. And um, also, because Whenever you do an acquisition, there should be something that they mention here that is called organizational fit. And what is organizational fit? You have two different corporations. One is acquiring the other. So the practices and the management model of this organization should fit somehow the management model of the other one. If they don't fit, then there's going to be a lot of problems, issues, and in the end, that could be costly or that could compromise the performance of that particular acquisition. Therefore, cultural distance could make this fit easier or more difficult. So, one way to avoid that, if there's great cultural distance, is to use a joint venture or a wholly owned subsidiary. <clears throat> Therefore, and this is very important, we expect that the use of acquisitions by foreign firms entering the United States should be dissuaded the more distant the culture of the country of origin. In other words, they generate a hypothesis. They divide it into two, which I'm going to explain. The greater the cultural distance between the country of the investing firm and the country of entry, the more likely a firm will choose a joint venture or wholly owned greenfield over an acquisition because of the costs and the organizational fit that I was explaining to you in a minute. How do you put that graphically? I'm going to show you. This is one way of saying it, right? We're saying the greater, the bigger the cultural distance, the longer the distance, then there's going to be a tendency that is going to be bigger to choice a joint venture or wholly owned greenfield over an acquisition. How do you express that mathematically? Like this. You have here the cultural distance. You have here the costs of management, the transaction cost. And what you see is that there's a relationship. There's a direct relationship. As one increases, the other one should be increases, increasing. If this one decreases, the other one decreases. Um, because acquisition and wholly owned subsidiaries or joint ventures are associated with costs of management. We go back to hypothesis two, right? Hypothesis two, the greater the culture of, inv of, an, of the investing firm is characterized by uncertainty avoidance. Remember that uh, Hofstede um, dimension? Um, well, they use it here and they say, well, if the country of origin has more uncertainty avoidance regarding organizational practices, then it's more likely that they avoid acquisitions which are riskier and more uncertain, and they go for joint venture or wholly owned greenfields which seem like more secure bets. How do you express that? Like this, right? The greater the culture of the investing firm is characterized by uncertainty avoidance, then the more likely the firm will choose a joint venture or a wholly owned greenfield over an acquisition. In other words, what we have is a linear relation. Linearity. Okay. How many understand that's linearity? Now that we understand that, we can go back to our Shinkar paper. Why? One of the first things that they're going to criticize here is precisely the illusion of, have it here, the illusion of linearity. And they criticize it. They say, well, how is the illusion of linearity presented? The higher the distance between cultures, the higher the likelihood that, A, investment will occur at a later stage in the investment sequence, B, a less controlling entry mode will be chosen, 
on C, the worse the performance of falling affiliate will be. And these are all questionable assumptions. He's going to say, why is it that it has to be linear? Nobody says it has to be like that. There's another illusion here, the illusion of symmetry, and they explain it beautifully. It suggests an identical role for the home and host cultures. For instance, for instance, that a Dutch firm investing in China is faced with the same cultural distance <coughs> as a Chinese firm investing in the Netherlands. Why? Probably one is more likely to occur than the other, right? The illusion of stability. They don't account for changes in time. And culture does change in time. Um, there are more illusions or, you know, mistakes, basically. Now, regarding linearity, for example, the expatriate culture suggests that adaptation to a foreign culture may be U-shaped, not linear, but U-shaped. Well, that's very interesting, right? There are more illusions. The illusions of casualty, which is that culture determines for indirect investment, and maybe it doesn't, we don't really know. The illusion of discordance, that cultural differences are a source of problems. And, well, not necessarily. First of all, because not every cultural gap is critical to performance, and sometimes because cultural differences don't create issues. Cultural differences could be complementary, and therefore have a positive synergistic, synergetic excuse me, effect on investment and performance. So we cannot assume that cultural differences are bad. Sometimes cultural differences are desirable and great. There are also methodological properties that they criticize. The assumption of corporate homogeneity, which is that they assume that the corporations are all the same and there's no corporate cultural variance, which there is in companies. Subsidiaries differ for him from you know, among themselves and with headquarters. <clears throat> cultural culture alters the dynamics of national culture distance through, or though not necessarily in the way of reducing its impact. The assumption of spatial homogeneity. They select a unit of study that is the country, but maybe there are intracultural variation, subnational region variation. For example, in Colombia, we have differences between, I don't know, Antioquia and Guajira. And those are very important cultural differences. You know, we're not homogeneous in terms of culture. We have different preferences and different values. So we cannot assume that countries are going to be homogeneous in their cultures. The assumption of equivalence. And the assumption of equivalence, let me go back here, it's uh, related with this idea that all of the values are equally important and some cultural gaps are less disruptive than others. So that's not um, also um, valid. So um, they're going to say, well, you know, those are problems. And they suggest later that maybe we should not be discussing cultural distance. We should not be saying how similar or different cultures are. We should be saying maybe how much friction they cause when they come into um, interaction. But they also say, hey, listen, you know, there are elements that close cultural distance. What, for example, globalization? Because there's, you know, a convergence, a harmonization that is happening. I'm sure you have multiple examples of that. Geographical proximity sometimes can reduce anti-barriers and can reduce cultural distance, importantly. Foreign experience. The more foreign experience you have, the less problems you're going to find communicating. Um, acculturation, which means, you know, some individuals become acculturated and stop acting as the rest of the individuals in that particular culture. This is very important because uh, sometimes that does have to do with, um, with education. That is, in a way, when we develop 
um, cultural competencies, like the ones that you have been researching about, you become acculturated to some extent. That means that you don't act um, automatically on culture, that you have like a filter and, uh, and, and you can choose which values to pursue and, and which actions to, 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 to undertake. Um, cultural attractiveness. Some cultures are simply sexier than others. And, uh, and cultural attractiveness does play an important part on um, why we have preferences for some countries than others. Um, also, staffing. Um, if you employ, for example, by cultural individuals, uh, you can reduce cultural distance and you can reduce uh, potential cultural pitfalls or misunderstandings. So the kind of people that you employ, it's going to affect national or corporate uh, cultural distance. Um, and that is important. So they say, well, we should be looking at cultural interaction as friction, not as distance, but friction. Some are easier, some are difficult. Um, and they, they say, well, distance is a metaphor. Let's change it for friction. And what do you mean? Uh, by friction, we mean the scale and essence of the interface between interaction cultures and the drag produced by the interface for the operation of those systems. What do they mean to the interface? Usually when you study friction in physics, it accounts for the size of the uh, you know, touch between two surfaces, right? If the touch is minimal, then friction is less. If the touch is more complete, friction is going to be more. And also the drag, you know, how the texture of those uh, materials is going to interplay. So we have to account for those two facts, how much of an area is going to be exposed to the other culture and what type of, uh, you know, um, drag we're going to have. Uh, for that part, I recommend that you read the rest of the paper and, um, and that you take into account these uh, very short things that I'm saying when you prepare this week's work. Thank you very much.